Disruptors and Curious Minds, welcome to episode four of the Thinking on Paper book club, where it's chapter four, but it's actually episode five, but we're still on the nexus, the new convergence of art, technology and science. And chapter four felt to me, it's a bit like watching a film trailer. I know something is coming and it, maybe it's the art of storytelling. It's like increasing the my frustrations because I want to get to the juicy part. To the, the tension, he's building tension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Building tension because I think me and you both had the same feeling about chapter four, Jeremy. Did we not? I agree. Yeah, it's a you know we we stay on this theme of of these these three domains that are going to be central to the whole book: art, tech, and science. And I think um, in this chapter. You know, it was a very detailed breakdown of like different qualities of of those domains. You know, their central drivers, the age, methodology, how they grow, uh, the uniqueness of product, how they manage IP, talent pipelines, and all of that through art, science, and in tech. Which, yeah. like, as I think about it, and as we were talking earlier, like, you have you have to show you have to show how something is different before you can start threading the needle between, right? Yeah, which is what he, he, out, he outlines that at the beginning of the chapter. That's exactly what he says. In order to, to wield these tools, you need to understand about their inner, inner drivers. And it, it is clear. I mean, one of the things about this book is it's a piece of art as much as it is a story. So you have... It's very well laid out. It's very easy to follow art, technology, and science across the top, and then he outlines it, like growth mode and he explains it for art, technology, and and science. It's it's easy to follow, um, but um, yeah, I want to get to the good bit. That said, there was some really interesting bits in this. I'm going to pull out this mind map as my I love first, mind maps. yeah, my first show and tell from chapter four. Um, it's a the Museum Gallery Network of Contemporary Art. And what it is, it's a mind map of over um, about half a million exhibitions in 16,000 galleries and how they are connected between artist, curator, museum. And, and, and if, if the same artist has been present at one or two galleries, they are connected, etc. And, and what was interesting about that for me is how few galleries there were how few museums there were and, and and i always i know yesterday maybe because we had sebastian borgia and we were talking about the metaverse one of the big drivers of interest in the metaverse has been like this breakdown of geographical borders and art for everybody galleries for everybody museums for everybody and i think this is a rep if this is a representation of all the world's art it seems very 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 centralized yeah, and I think I think I think another thing that was interesting, maybe out of this chapter along this line, or maybe it was a previous chapter, but I thought it was really lined up with what you just talked about in this mind map, is that like one of the biggest centers of art, you know, globally, you know, and people argue how these how these epicenters ebb and flow, but New York, right, is is kind of an art epicenter, right? But the community that makes up that domain in that field which he talks about domains and fields in this chapter is very very small when you think about it like 2000 people or something that are in this in this domain in this field in New York right so smaller it's, than we think it's, it's tiny it's yeah it's nothing it's a, a, a 2000 people it's very very small um Whereas there's not quite a lot of chat um, quotes I wanted to bring up um, some very nice pictures. Of yeah, the art. imagery is great. And I love the little story nuggets uh, in the footnotes. Like those are the some of those tend to be uh, almost more inspiring than, than some of the some of the lead paragraphs. Right. These little story nuggets that you can jump jump into if you want to or not. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have anything that particularly you want to bring up because your turn, because I've got something I want to mention as well. So you, if you go, if you've got something that you want to bring up. Yeah. The, the big thing that stood out to me in this chapter was, was the idea of nurturing and recognition systems, recognition systems being kind of the most prominent, but nurturing systems on how things come out of these domains, how little ideas, uh, you know, start and, and get to become big things. But 
Could you explain, expand on that? Yeah. So, um, so how, how like a crazy idea in someone's head goes to become an innovative product or how, uh, an idea in an artist's mind becomes, uh, something that's world renowned eventually captured. Right. So I started thinking about this and I think the people that are, that are, that are reading this with us and the, and the people that watch, um, that, that watch the show and listen to the show are trying to figure out how to apply some of these ideas to their businesses, to their, to their work and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, recognition, recognition systems, and I'm going to call them crazy ideas, you know, just yeah. like, you know, uh, cause, because Peter Diamandis, you know, he wrote a bunch of books, bold abundance, you know, the I'm sorry, X prize. I think he was part of that whole thing. You know, the day before, uh, a breakthrough happens, it's a crazy idea, right? The day before something is a breakthrough, it's considered a crazy idea. So how do companies, how can companies put recognition systems in to, um, to evolve and nurture really cool interdisciplinary ideas without squashing them immediately, right? So if, it, for example, like say I have a business that makes um, refrigerators, right? And you're in that business and you come up with this whole wonderful way to keep our food fresh for a long, long time, but it's not a refrigerator. And, you know, me and my company, I'm be like, well, I'm not gonna be able to sell refrigerators any longer. I'm going to squash the idea. It's kind of like what happened with, um, with Kodak, right? Kodak yeah, okay, yeah. had, they invented the digital camera before anybody else, but they're like, dude, if we put this out, no one's going to yeah, buy film, right? They, they shot themselves in the foot that day, didn't they? Fly totally, <laughs> totally. So, so that's the tricky part on, on the business side. Um, maybe it's one of those things to know when you come up with the idea, whether you're in the right domain and field as, as uh, the author talks about. And if you're not in the right domain and field, how do you, how do you create enough exit velocity to spin it up somewhere else, right? Yeah, I like those words. Um, the Kodak example is a perfect, you kind of like destroyed your own argument there because any brands go, hold on, we can't do that because look at Kodak, what happened to Kodak. Um, I don't know where the fridge idea came from, but it's, it's brilliant. So you asked the question, how can a brand, how can a company give crazy ideas space without just shutting them down? Any ideas how they could do that? So... Yeah, so the, the space, I wrote that down too. Like in, in my in my note here, if I could find it. Like how do we like how do you how do you create enough space? Like room to think big, but oh here it is. I, I wrote room to think big, but tight processes to elevate and resource to a proof of concept that has key performance indicators, right? right. So um so have the space to think big let's get crazy let's get you know hey no wrong answer uh and and then whatever shakes out then you can kind of look at the matrix of well how does this apply to our business but don't just be a to b with it you know you got to think about like what the business is going to do and how the business is going to evolve over time right because you that that's a whole piece of the cycle but i think you're right it's space but you know just like uh i don't know if you remember reading about back in the day like skunk works Lockheed Martin's advanced development uh, program back okay. in the seventies, this guy, Kelly Johnson uh, ended up running it and he had like 14 principles of, you know, trying to accelerate these new ideas, but skunk works was kept away from the main business, right? It's did they, like, did they, yeah. did they, is that right. where the blackbird came from or is this post? You uh, know, I don't know. That's a good question. But I think it's got to be separate. Whatever happens for this, for this neck, there needs to be like a nexus thinker segment or capability in every business, right? And that oh, nexus know. thinker capability in every business has to be organized by a nexus thinker who builds these bridges between um, between all the different departments and and pulls them in and out as as necessary. Yeah, I love that idea. Part time, full time. Man, I th I think eventually, I mean, the way companies work, I mean, I saw this in the whole Web3 thing when the Web3 piece kind of came up and I was pulled in to help as a consultant to build Web3 capabilities or explore Web3 capabilities for companies. Some continued to do that. Some hired people, some 
threw it on some internal person's plate in that organization. But man, I think, I think the nexus thinker mentality has to come out of the innovation department, right? You know, or, or I don't know, it, it needs, it needs to be permanent in my opinion. Okay. Just on that web three front, I think that, um, are, are you still being used as a consultant? Because some of the, the, the brands that I, I write for, they uh, have almost developed a web three department now not department but you know full-time roles whereas a couple of years ago they were kind of side hustles for your marketing job right um maybe maybe yeah maybe nexus thinking could is there is there the i was reading i can't remember who it was by maybe the farnham street or something but immediate gratification is that it's going to be difficult for brands to embrace this idea because the immediate profit or advantage might not well they might not be immediate it might take weeks months years decades before something comes from that and you know be quite difficult to to build that part of the company knowing that there might not ever be a a reward a tangible profitable reward in it that's that's it it goes back to this theme that we've always had this this ebb and flow between hierarchical and emergent systems right and and i think the core of innovation the core of creativity um the core of you know, even tech, right? The the early uh, segments of tech when you're trying to develop something new, things have to be done a little bit without expectation. You have to put energy in without expecting an immediate result. And that is in pure conflict with the PL responsibilities of every business, not just private, but man, public companies. You know, you got you got boards, you got shareholder calls, all of that stuff, right? So that's why this whole skunk works idea is very interesting where you could kind of tuck it away um, and have some tangible, I mean, Google X, you know, X labs is, is, you know, Google does this and Xerox park was another one. And, um, you know, they've been kind of successful over the years of, of okay. keeping the innovators away from the people that are driving the immediate results. Okay. Yeah. That's fair, fair point. And all of the universities have innovation labs, don't they separate from their main faculties as well so um, yep. maybe we could speak to our university friends and get nexus thinking professors <laughs> i love it i love it what so so let me ask you a question mark so with with uh, oh art tech and science these three these three domains that are there um we've seen he's outlined some differences and i know we're feeling that we're, we're waiting we're waiting for this tension to resolve right where we figure out how it all connects what are some what is the commonality that you see between those things uh at the moment that that is kind of interesting to you well i don't know if it's, if it's answering your question exactly but there was a piece on the uniqueness of products and art technology and science and he describes the process of art generally one of a kind products have mark of the creator but for science he, he says if something is discovered it means it was there all the time but one can rightfully say that theories are created and they have the imprint of the creator okay science is discovered it means it was there all the time and i was i read rick rubin's book the creative act recently and he, he maybe art writing art digital art physical art is already there and as the we, the creator we just discover it and it was always there in the same way that you know gravity was there whether galileo discovered it or not and i'm probably sure did he discover it i know but the fact that it was already there maybe the creation is already there and you do, and, and your job as a writer or an artist is just to discover it in the same way that a scientist discovers an advancement or it's, it's really funny that you mentioned that because that is the commonality that I started to think about too, right? Everything, I don't know why this is, but everything always points back to quantum mechanics for me in a lot of ways, right? And I've been reading this book, another book uh, at the moment that I won't go into too much because we're, we're focusing on this one. But this talks about, this book really references um, the multiverse kind of strategy, right? right. Uh, or theory. And you know that everything, all potential of all things is happening all at the same time, but is only revealed to participants that are within that multiverse, right? So, you know, it, it, it goes back to like 
the wave function, right? So it's probability until someone observes something, right? So there could yeah. be something to what Rick Rubin is saying, but I would agree like art is like, it's art, you, you have an antenna. I think Rick Rubin talks about having like a clear antenna to be able to pull the ideas down. Um, so yeah, maybe all of the stuff is already there and it's all being unveiled and it's not just science that does that. And I, I think that's a perfect way to end chapter four, James. I don't well, let me, let me, end give, on a let me give one. There's one quote I want to end okay. with that I, that I was really excited about um, that's, that talks about perspective shift, which I think is very important for Nexus thinkers, right? It's important for everybody, but it's important for Nexus thinkers to help coax this out of people that are more you know, single discipline, single threaded and very focused on one thing. Right. But um, here's a quote that says, um, let's see, seeing something that we may have seen a hundred times before now, uh, or a hundred times before, but now see it in a different light, a new viewing that makes the familiar become unfamiliar. This is in, in quotes, this is bestrangement, as the Russian formalists call it, or per perplex perplexion, which Bestrangement is really interesting. I like that right? word. Yeah, bestrangement. So, you know, Da Vinci always talked about this, looking something, looking at something from another angle, from another position, that you see it as the potential of being more than what it is for face value. So I think that is really important for single-threaded, very focused um, people in, in single disciplines, which we need, which we need people that focus deeply on one thing, right? Because yeah. they will be the experts in that one thing that Nexus thinkers can bring in and, and, and create great things with, but it's important to be able to flip it on its head and look at it very different. So bestrangement, let's, uh, that, that's the, that's the, that's the resonant frequency in my brain right now. And how do you train bestrangement? I, th I think you have to be willing to look a little silly. You have to be willing to be silly and you know, adults aren't willing to be silly at all. And if you're willing to be silly, you can poke things around and almost activate this, more divergent thinking capability instead of the convergent thinking capability. Like it, love it. All right, well, that was fun. That and, was uh, fun, yeah. I'm so, energized. Uh, yeah, do you want to tell tell our audience anything else? Make sure they're inviting folks to this who who would enjoy this conversation. Share it. What I else? think you've just you done that. Yeah, we we do need book recommendations for the next book because we are going to go immersive. We are going to go interactive. We'll be doing this in a group, so we need to choose the second book i know we're going slowly through the nexus because it's so awesome next book you'll help us choose that um other than that join us next week we've got neil redding who's a futurist and it's going to be a, a journey into spatial computing and ar mycelium, and vr mycelium networks mycelium networks divergent thinking emergent systems it's going to be fun and we also, guys, we also have 48 episodes of Thinking on Paper <laughs> that is that are on YouTube and Spotify and all podcast platforms. So Mark and I uh, were, were kind of celebrating that earlier. So uh, go and check out some episodes. Yeah. There's got to be one there that you'll find interesting. Thanks for listening. Thanks for checking it out. Share this book club with your buddies, and we'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye.